Welcome to Ink and Magic, a podcast where we read and discuss the writing craft, world building, and romance of paranormal and fantasy novels. If you love books with bite, set in worlds of magic and mayhem, then you're in the right place. My name's Nikisha Shane. I go by an S. And I'm Leslie. I write as Elle Penelope. And welcome to the show. Hey, Leslie. We are back with another craft episode. And we have another celebrity guest, and I'm so excited for you all to hear all of her wisdom and knowledge. She's a fabulous writer. I enjoyed her books many years before I ever met her. And we have Sarah Cannon on the show. We Yay, do. I'm so excited to be here. Yay. We're so excited to have you. For those people living under a rock, let me tell you a little bit about our girl, Sarah Cannon. She is an Amazon top 100 bestselling author. And she writes magical contemporary fantasy novels with both teens and college age characters. And in her books, you're going to find lots of twists that you never see coming, which is what we're going to talk about today. Her novels often stem from her own experiences growing up in the small town of Hawkinsville, Georgia, where she learned that being popular always comes at a price and relationships are rarely as simple as they seem. Our friend has sold over three quarters of a million books. Woohoo! And over she one. loves it's over one now. <laughs> over, Use us. over a million. Okay. We have to update Use the bio. Us. <laughs> yes. And she loves writing witchy books and connecting with fans and connecting with friends. And we are so thankful that she is one of our friends. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. Hi. Oh my gosh. I love you both. So thank you for having me on. This is gonna be fun. I love cliffhangers and twists. It's my yeah. favorite. So I feel like we're being very, very generous because we get Sarah to ourselves. She's one of our writing morning writing partners, and it's just a joy to see her stories take life on a daily basis. So what we're hoping to do today, though, is we are hoping not to talk about beginnings because we had that conversation before, Leslie and I. We want to talk about endings. We want to talk about chapter endings. We want to talk about scene endings. We want to talk about book endings because Sarah is so good at this. She, her books have been given the nicknames of having Sarah hangers. Not just a cliffhanger. She is her own type of cliffhanger, the Sarah hanger. So she's obviously an expert at this. <laughs> like dun 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 is just a common phrase in my fan group because <laughs> they always know it's coming like what what it which chapter when's the chapter gonna end they have that tension as they get to like a certain pace they feel it and they're like here it comes dun 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 it's coming they know uh just because of my style of writing is that that sort of pacing and it's there's a dun 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 moment a lot <laughs> many chapters in my books so first of all, you are you a plotter or a pantser? We must know. I am an obsessive plotter. <laughs> I love to have really it's intuitive process to a degree. It's just I have to know certain things in order to get started writing. I got to know what I think the ending is, although almost every book it does change by the time I get to the ending, but I need to feel like I'm anchored in that ending. I need to know what the twist at the midpoint is because I'm doing so much to build up to that twist that I can't feel good about what I'm writing on the way there because I'm like, I don't know if this is going towards the twist or not because I don't know what the twist is. So that's kind of a sort of a milestone that I need to have figured out beforehand. And same thing with that uh, act one climax, that first doorway. I don't always have to know how I'm moving into the finale, but I'd need to know kind of the, the beginning, the act one climax, that midpoint and the ending. And if I can also know on top of that, of course, the character's journey the motivation, the emotions that they're going through, that internal thing that is a huge part of what feeds into the twists and the expectations is that internal monologue. So I know all of that ahead of time. I have a big wall on my room that is just full of post-it notes and a visual. I'm such a visual learner that I have to, I can't just sit in my head and think through it. I have to have it out where it's not in my head. I can see it and move things around. And then I also, on top of that, create index cards that have basically what's the main conflict of the scene, what does my character want in the scene, and how do they get thwarted in that? Like what trips them up? And then what's the symbol crash, <laughs> which is like what's that dun 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 moment at the end? So you're planning out your Sarah Hangers, your dun-dun-dun moments? 
to a degree. Yeah. I don't always know them before I start writing. And sometimes I'll have an idea of it, but it won't come out right on the page. And so I'm just, will a lot of my chapters in my first draft just end make this better. Like <laughs> literally in brackets, it'll just say make this better because I, I, it's like a, a puzzle piece that fits into place just perfectly. And you hear that snap. Mm -hmm. That's what happens in my body physically when something resonates just right. That last line comes and I cannot let go of it in edits until that snap is there for me, if that makes sense. Totally. The, intui the intuition is so, it's a bit, such a big part of the process, even as a plotter. Like I totally resonate with that. Yeah. That does make sense. And I heard two parts going on there. I heard the overview with those three anchoring points of your act one climax, your midpoint twist, and then the ending. Do you, and then I heard the second part, which is the, at the scene level, but I want to look at the, the bigger picture first. So you say you know those three going in. I wonder, do you know them in order? Does one come and then you figure out the other two? You know what's, what's funny that happens to me quite often is I will say this is going to be my act one moment and then it won't be. It'll, that'll be my midpoint. And it'll have to shift and change a little bit, but I'm, I'm super fast paced. And so I, even though my book might be a hundred thousand words, that first 20,000 words is hopefully going to be a little bit of setup, but a lot of like, okay, we're really pulling you in pretty quickly. And then it's just action after like twist after twist after twist, hopefully like things you don't see coming around the bend. I just like to keep people on the edge of their seat. But of course, as you both know, that's about pacing too, because someone on the edge of their seat for the whole book might get bored on the edge of their seat. It's too, <laughs> True. too many. Right. That's such a good point, Sarah. I, cause I believe, I, th I look at it almost like it's, it's a song. Like when we talk about pacing, I grew up in a band. I wasn't in the band. I just grew up inside of the band. And so, <laughs> another story. So I, I I heard all these lessons and these musicians talking about how, you know, like the, the, the bass had its beat and then the drum came in at this point. And so when I think about pacing, I'm thinking about how the music is going. And it's so interesting what you say about how you 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 might hear it and you might not and it sometimes it slows up and sometimes it slows down that's kind of how i see it like and, and i like to think of that as like characters like maybe your heroine is the vocals and maybe mm. your um your another sub character is like the bass beat yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a really cool way to think about it i think about it from video editing because mm. i started video editing in in high school and i'm always that's how I approach pacing and editing. And similar to music, there's a rhythm to it. There's an internal vibe. Like when I'm editing, I just feel a cut. Like I feel where it's going to be, where I need to pause, where the music comes up. And so taking that that skill into book writing. And and Sarah, actually, you have a really interesting background. Oh, yeah. In the arts that I'm sure comes That was not that. purposeful. Right? Tell us what your background is before writing. I mean, I used to sing from a very young age. Actually, my grandmother used to sing on the radio in Indiana with her two sisters. So they were like a trio that was kind of well known in that area on the locals radio stations and stuff. And they traveled. So there's a lot of singers in my family. And so when I decided to go to college, it was like, do I major in creative writing in English, which I also wanted to do, or do I major in music? And in the end I decided I can write when I'm old, but I can't necessarily develop a Broadway singing career or an opera singing career you know, well, I mean, you probably could, but it's a little bit harder the older you get and the more your your voice matures. It's like you kind of need that training earlier on as your voice kind of hits that maturity. So I was like, okay, we're going to double major in English and vocal performance, but I'm mostly going all in vocal performance. And I was in the band as well, started in fifth grade, started playing piano in third grade, played the organ, flute, saxophone, uh, lots of different instruments. And then got my master's degree in opera performance and did not really ever fully use it, <laughs> but I it's, it's in the back. And sadly, when I had my first child, something changed in my vocal cords and I just do not have my upper, upper range anymore. And doctors could not really figure it out, but it's kind of gone. So it sort of like separates my two lives in a way, like writer and singer. Mm -hmm. Do you find that 
consciously you're bringing in anything from your musical training into writing and editing? Or do you think it's mostly subconscious? I think it's probably mostly subconscious, although I would say it's that storytelling too. Like I, I've trained in opera because that's kind of what you do. You either Broadway singer or you're an opera singer or, or you're a choral singer, right? And I loved art song because art song told a story. Now opera does too, but with other people like art song, you're the, you're the solo performer and you can craft that story to your exact liking, which is makes no surprise that I became an independent author rather than a traditionally published author, because I want that creative control. But I loved putting together those songs that were like German, French, Italian art song to create a, a larger story through all of them. And that was fun for me. But then they told me, nobody makes a career doing that. You have to be an opera singer first, and then you can sing art song because you've earned it, I guess. Yeah, I've <laughs> it never heard of career, art song. But, I am yeah. not familiar with that. So I think I always pulled my love of storytelling into my music. So they've kind of held each other, held each other up. But I, I think also I just sort of closed my heart off to that in a way. And so this is, this is my song now is my mm-hmm. book. Yeah. I mean, oh, it, Inez, <laughs> I know you should see Inez's face. She's like, Oh, it's so sad. No, we don't want to lose anything. <laughs> I'm talking to my children. <laughs> Yeah. And, and losing something important like that. Like I used to dance a lot. And I mean, I, I studied dance all my, my whole entire childhood. And then later on, I tried to dance again. I'm like, I lost a big chunk of skill. And so anytime you kind of lose something that, we, that was um, part of your identity or part of your foundation, it is really difficult. But I think yeah. we can find other things as writing, which seems like we've all found to maybe fill that gap and, and build yeah. on that foundation it feels it feels similar though you know when you when you're singing an aria or a song you always have that same sense of pacing you know you've got that build up you've got the swell and the crescendo you've got and then maybe you have the soft moments that are a little bit more intimate and mean something and then maybe there's like a more dramatic moment towards the end where there's the big high note you know or whatever and everyone stands on their feet you know that's that kind of feeling you can recreate that so I guess even though I haven't actually thought of it that way I am recreating that in my writing that is intuitively a way to think of it though because before I got us off off rail sorry <laughs> that's the tendency um you you're talking you were talking about how um you you can't just have them constantly on the high you can't have mm-hmm. them just constantly on the end of, of your seat and you're right if a song is constantly on a high note that kind of you get I think a, that would make me antsy, right? You don't give me a minute, yeah, yeah. You don't give me a minute to sit still. And I think that that is really what pacing is. Just what you how you described it as a song is exactly what I think it is. Uh, build up, swell, crescendo, decrescendo, um, soft moments, high note. And so this the same way that you were trained with your ear, the, that's how the words are coming out. And you yeah. you know this is like the pacing of a song. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I never thought of it that way, but I think that's exactly what it is. And I think, you know, when I think about the ending specifically of a chapter or of a piece, you know, a a sequence, it's always about how does this resonating, which is such a musical word, right? And I actually use the term, I know you sent me something that said button, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I use the term symbol crash, Yes, which I feel like I got that from a book, but I can't say which one it was, but it maybe it was a James Scott Bell something, but I, that has always resonated with me. The idea of a symbol crash, because it's like, you know, that, that last like psh, at the end of a, you know, marching band or something like that, because you, you might have some quiet moments, but then there's that opening to something new, something unexpected. And I love to do that where you have a quiet, intimate moment between characters where you really see some kind of personal growth or their realization of something. And you want them to have a little bit of time to think about it. But then before you know it, someone's rushing into the room or something big has happened and the moment is lost. And I think that can create this feeling of, I mean, it has to be done in a way that you don't give your readers whiplash, like it feel it has to feel like it belongs in the story. But at the same time, it can be also really exciting to have those highs and lows in emotions as you're reading. This is so fascinating because I did send you something about buttons because that's how I understand um, 
scene endings or chapter endings because I come from TV and we had to contend with commercials. So you were going to have that break. So I we we were taught that you have to you, their strategies to get people back, to hold them in place and to get them back. But there's also strategies in the song. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious now to see if there's any parallels. So with the buttons, um, I talk about how like a period, that's like there's a resolution, like somebody goes to sleep at the end of the chapter, which we're told not to do, right? Because that, that <laughs> kind of releases the tension, right? So I, I, I bet as you transition from songs, like you don't have that many periods, but you do have exclamation points, which is that high heightened impact. And that's the symbol crash, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I think there are some moments, especially right before bigger battle scenes that are coming, especially if the character knows like tomorrow's the big day kind of thing that you can and maybe sometimes should end on a period because you're giving the reader just a minute to breathe, but they're coming back because they know what's next. Like they're gonna they're gonna be there because they want to see that big battle. They know it's still on it. They're still they're still experiencing the tension, but you're giving them a moment of like the okay. calm before the storm. The calm right? before the storm. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's important to, to to have them have that moment to rest because they're getting ready. Because sometimes I find that you know that we've all experienced. I know and as at, le at least has like you get to like sixty or seventy percent in the book, and you know something bad is, hap is happening, but you're at the point where everything is good, and you just stop reading. Like sometimes yeah. you don't feel like <laughs> going through the drama, and sometimes I think it's a it's an internal thing. But sometimes maybe the craft isn't you're you're not excited about it you're, there's more dread than excitement or mm -hmm. something is off with the pacing where it's like okay i've been exhausted by this book this is a nice place for me to end at 72 percent, and i'm sure that i you know i will go someplace else but like here is the end and so our job is to sort of up the tension keep it high but have those breaks so that you don't feel so exhausted that you can't get through the third act crisis mm -hmm. you know well and that you have now, this is potentially my genre, too. I don't know. I would have to sit back and think, do I do this also in romance when I've written romance? But um, in, you know, young adult fantasy, I do have a lot of those battles and those moments. But it's also the questions that are there. Like, I want to know who the high priestess is. And unless I read to the end of this, I'm not going to know who that is. Like, I, I want to know what happened to Harper's mother. So you've got those threads coming through that are the questions, not necessarily the story question itself, but they're questions that are integral to the story itself in such that like your character needs to know this, like something along those lines. And if you make them really care about this mystery that you have, they're going to keep reading even if they're exhausted. <laughs> but I know my, my fans definitely will say, oh, I hate that moment when it's, you think, okay, we're at the end, like this is going to be the big battle. And then you look down and you see in a Sarah Cannon book, it's only 60% and you're like, oh no, there's something else is coming after this um, because that's not going to be the resolution. So like, what can be worse than this? And they know it's coming, <laughs> which is fun for me. That's the best. Speaking of questions, I think that that was another one of, of my buttons. If you ask a question at the end of a scene or at the end of the chapter, you have to turn the page, right? And I'm wondering... Is there a musical equivalent? Because to me, it's kind of like in the in the music, like like in one of those songs where they're like hyping you up, hyping you up, and then it kind of goes down, but you know the bass is gonna come back and like and slam. Like, is there a a thing where you where the music kind of swells and then there's a pause? And it yeah, goes I mean, you know, there's it's all in the chord progressions, right? It's mm. like unresolved chord progression. You're not back to the main key of the piece. You know, maybe you've kind of. Um, you've got some, it's just resolution, right? It's the same words. It's the same terminology, which I never had really thought about, but until you get back to that like home key and you're have that resolved chord progression, you don't feel, and a lot of people don't even know what chord progressions are, but they feel that in the music. And this is a similar yeah. thing with, mm -hmm. with, with the stories. And it's like, sometimes the ending isn't the resonance of the ending isn't even, just about exactly what happens it's about the specific way you word it mm, yeah as you could say that or it's that you know button is also a good word for it but it's that what is your character feeling about it so it's not even a plot thing it's the internal 
processing thing. So if your character, like I just was working on a scene yesterday in my book that's upcoming, The Disappearance of Vanessa Shaw, where two characters that had a history together have an argument in the woods. And when he, she walks away from him, it's like, that's plot, right? Partially, like what, what she's, how she's moving through, that's the mechanics of the story. But that last sentence that she's thinking, what she's taking away from that argument, that's where the resonance is. And that's where we see, is this character growing from this? Is mm. she is she angry with him? Or is this melancholy for her? Like, how does she feel? And your reader's going to feel the same way that character feels. That reminds me of the concept of mirroring, like the way that you phrase something. So they say if you if it's if it's possible to have the very first lines of your book somehow mirror the very last lines yeah. in theme or even language, I try to do this as much as possible. Uh, so you can end a book and the same events happen, but the words that you choose, if it, if it calls back to something that you did at the very beginning, there's that sense of satisfaction. It's like you're closing the loop emotionally, and it's yeah. very satisfying for a reader. And uh, it sounds like what what you're doing here, and that kind of comes intuitively. It's like it's like we said the feeling, like you feel like oh, it's not quite done yet. What do I? Oh, let me try to just have this phrase or this image, this closing yeah. image there. To me, of- it's worth the time to sit and really think of how, exactly how I want to word this. And in fact, I think it can have so much impact that I feel like my career is built on a, a single line mm. at the very end of my very first book. Because if you go back, if you're curious and you want to go grab my first three books, they're all free. Uh, it's called Beautiful Demons Box Set. I mean, this was me... 13, 14 years ago, not the most talented, like complex writer. There's a lot of turns of phrase that are more simple or the plot is, it's only 50,000 words. It's just a more simple plot than what I have going on now. But it's that resonance that will keep a reader coming, even if it's not the most literary thing, you know, in the world. It may not be the best, you know, example of someone who's an amazing writer, but it's the way that story resonates. And I'll tell you the last line, even though it's, it's not really a spoiler because you don't know the context, but the name of the book is beautiful demons. And at the very end of this climax, and you've got this character in this vulnerable moment of kind of like, Oh my gosh, what the heck just happened? And how is this going to go into the, you know, into her life? And a character walks up to her and says, you're going to make a beautiful demon. And what she means is a beautiful demons cheerleader, right? Because it's the mean girls cheerleader kind of crowd. But it's just that resonance of that that phrase in that moment that so many people were like, <gasps> it meant something, even though it's the most simple thing in the world. It's just like, what is this? It, you can tell it has multiple meanings, but you mm-hmm. don't fully understand what they all are. Yeah. And so that's the intrigue of it's not really a cliffhanger because everything for this story mystery has been resolved. There are of course threads because, you know, it's a series, but it's that last moment of, oh my gosh, what is that even going to mean for her? I got to read the next book. And there's a lot of people that have, I think have felt that way. Plus the fact that so many people didn't see the twists. So I think that excites a lot of readers in that particular genre. Mm -hmm. It's like an ellipsis. It's like, you know, there's more coming. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when I was, you know, I guess I read, I was reading Beautiful Demon, the Shadow Demon Saga, when there were like five or six books out and you get to whatever book ended and the next one wasn't out yet. And I'm like, I I have to, I I hate waiting. I get that feeling because you did such a good job with those things in every, in every book. It's like pulling people through. So even early career when, yeah, we get better as we publish more books, as we write more books, we're always growing as writers. A lot of writers talk about their first book very negatively. And, you know, I don't think that we should. I mean, yes, we're probably better now, hopefully, but you were good enough then to draw the reader in, you know, good enough to have loyal readers. And there was something that you were doing that, you know, that was very, like I said, intuitive. And we can put words to it now. We can describe it more articulately now because we have studied more craft and know what we were doing. But just from a lifetime of reading, you know, even with the first books, we were probably doing a lot right if people 
we're going in there and continuing to follow us as as writers. Right. And I think a lot of times when people talk about being a good writer, they really do mean like, oh, how flowery are your metaphors? Or like, how deep is this converse? You know, how deep are we going into this physical wording of things, you know? But I think for most readers, it's just the core of how did this book make me feel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they don't care if you used like show, don't tell, as long as it pulled them in that's what matters. And of course we want to continue to improve our craft and continue to pull people in as best we can. And it's great when people have amazing, you know, actual talent of exactly how they put the words together. But to me, I am not a super descriptive writer. I don't, I'm not will of time go in and say this braid is this way. And <clears throat> I'm not boring. <laughs> And in fact, what was kind of funny for me, I know we're talking about description, but I was worried because in book five of my series, they do go into the shadow world. And that's probably my biggest cliffhanger of the whole series, like true cliffhanger, because you talk about like, oh, it's an ellipses or it's a button or it's something <clears throat> that end of book four is the true, a true cliffhanger. Like it's really a true cliffhanger. And I think it's the only one I've ever written that really just is like, what? And then you wait for book five. Um, but I was nervous about book five because they're in a fantasy world and I am not super descriptive. And I thought, I don't know that people will be able to see this in their head if I don't describe it more, but it just, I'm so much more focused on the feelings and emotions and so many people in the reviews and, and everything at the time were like, oh my gosh, I can see this so clearly. And it's just interesting to me how you can evoke all of that based on mostly feeling of the character. And then the readers will fill all of that in on their own. So we've been talking about... Um the scenes, scene endings. And we just kind of shifted a bit to talk about book endings, which is interesting to me. I I personally think that there's three types of endings. Like there's closure, which I know, Sarah, you're trying to get to in your Shadow Demon saga. You're going to get there. But that closure is when the story is complete. All the story questions are answered. Everybody, hopefully, because we are, we are in romance and romance adjacent, hopefully everybody is happy. And then there are the cliffhangers where something is unresolved. But what what the endings that interest me the most are the interest the endings that I call the open door endings, where something is left. It's almost like that ellipsis that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Something is left dangling. Threads are left open. And I think, I personally think, that that's a that's a kind of cliffhanger where you've closed off the 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 original story question of Will Harper. Uh, make the, the squad or will she find the, the this first bad guy and she does but then something else opens up something else happens I think th I personally think that that gives readers less of a reason to yell and more of a, a reason to plead with you to please please give me the next one and not yell at you like oh my god how could you that's my opinion there are really uh, violent cliffhangers and then there are more gentle <laughs> ones. I consider the open door a gentle one as opposed to literally stopping like that Spider-Man movie that just stopped in the middle of the movie. The newest animated Spider-Man was just like half a movie. Yeah, I was oh, so I'm mad at the one. end of that. Yeah. It was like, why did you make half a movie? And then, so that that's very violent as opposed to, yeah, the open door is more like, let's just gently ease you into the next book. <laughs> I mean, even in a cliffhanger that like that one at the end of book four, <clears throat> I don't complete, like I still am answering the story question. Mm -hmm. It's not a half book. It's just that the ending brings up such a bigger story question that it feels like it's not resolved. Right. So open door, you could say, book six was kind of the end of an arc. So I'm 11 books into the series with several spinoffs. So there's 16 books total wow. with the spinoffs and everything. So book six was the end of an arc. And then when you move on to book seven, you've got a new story. And in some ways, I think, oh, I wish I hadn't done it quite that way. Um, I had originally ended the series there and was planning to start a new series. And then when I started writing the new series, I was like, oh, this just is a continuation, really. And readers were confused. So I just combined them into one series and that worked better. But I 
still, if you look at any place where I have the most drop off, it's either between that free first book and the next book that's paid because people maybe didn't read it or they didn't enjoy it. Or it's after book six because they're like, oh, this is kind of resolved. Do I want to take this journey again or not? Especially when they look like Leslie was saying, and they see all the books aren't completed yet. And they know uh, I'm going to have to wait in between these cliffhangers. <laughs> I think a lot of readers have a love hate relationship with those types of endings because they, they, and I mean, I think some readers have an absolute hate relationship with them because they just can't handle the tension. It's not their thing. They want, they, they want the resolution and they want to feel good and they want to, you know, not have to feel tension. But I think a lot of people say they hate them because they hate waiting, but they secretly love it also because it's exciting. Yeah, they will write in your review. I hated this book. I'm writing the no next one right now. Or like, I hated this clip. You know, so yes, they hated it, but they're still going to buy and read it. Right. Have the other thing I wanted to say, I'm oh, sorry, time. just about the open door. I think Brandon Sanderson said this on the Writing Excuses podcast. There's a difference between ending a chapter with like, you know, the door opening and just like what's what's on the other side and ending a chapter where you step through the door and you're shocked and then Ooh. <laughs> that's like a subtle difference but like it, it makes a big difference emotionally to the reader because oh, yeah. that reaction as opposed to there's something in there then it's like i see it i'm reacting but the reader doesn't know what it is yeah that's good too that's so interesting <clears throat> most of mine are that feeling of either like the first few books of that particular series are very much a like, oh, there's more to come, like a haunting, like there's a lot of threads, but it's like, oh, this resonates, this last line resonates. And then in later books, like especially once you get seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, it's like a crash at the end, just like a shock. It's a shocking moment. So it'll feel like everything's almost resolved. And then this little sort of like an epilogue kind of moment opens a shocking door. And that is really fun for me to write because it's never ending. Like there's just, it's just really fun. I love it. I love reading it. I love writing it. You know, it's interesting to me. I'm, I'm starting to see authors put in their blurbs, no dark moment. And I'm not oh. sure how I feel about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I like a romance with no dark moment and I like to know, and people, you'll see people like when I was on Twitter, when it was Twitter, people would be like, I really want a warm hug of a romance. I don't want any angst. I don't want a dark moment. So you, people are searching for that. So telling people that there's no dark moment can be helpful, I think. But I'm wondering, like, what does that mean for the structure? If there's sometimes they say no dark moment. Sometimes they say no third act breakup. Breakup. Yes. I've not seen that. People are tired of that, too. That doesn't mean that there's not structurally a dark moment. I found in books that I really enjoy with no dark moment that a lot of the conflict happened early on. So this couple had such a hard time getting together in the first half of the book that by the time they are together in like the second half of act two, then there's some kind of external crisis that happens, but it's not a, a relationship crisis specifically in romance. And that takes the place. It's still a satisfying story, but when you've re read 60% of this book and they were just struggling, struggling, struggling. And then finally they get it together. They don't need to break up in act three, you know? But then is that a no breakup or is that a no dark moment? That's, I think that's where I'm struggling to understand. Cause I heard you, I heard you say conflict, 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 external pressure, happy ending. Mm -hmm. But isn't that external pressure? Isn't that still some kind of a moment might not be dark. Maybe that's what I'm struggling with, the dark. But there's a moment there. Yeah, but people are expecting that third act breakup according to romance rules. Mm -hmm. And I think if someone, and their definition of dark moment might be different than yours also. You know, there's probably still technically a dark moment where there's a dip, but it might not be the, uh, they break up for three years. So a dip a moment? A dip. <laughs> a, 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 that second pillar, I guess. Like if we're talking about, <clears throat> James Scott Bell talked about the two pillars. Yeah, um, that something has to happen at that point. Something kind of bad. See, and that's why I, I think some right. Something has to happen. So right. I'm, I guess my I'm I'm struggling. Is are they saying nothing should happen, or just I don't think so. The breakup. I have no idea, but I have wondered about that too. Like I kind of understand the no 
third act breakup means that there's something else that might pull these people apart, but they're not like betraying each other. They're not cheating on each other. They're not getting angry about miscommunication. Cause I think okay. that's like one of the biggest pet peeves is that so often third act break- breakups are just misunderstandings. Mm. And that can be frustrating because it's like, why didn't you just talk to her about this? You know, right. if it's something that could be just resolved that way. And I think a lot of readers are kind of over that sort of conflict of just like, I misunderstood what you were saying. <laughs> Yeah. And I didn't talk to you about it because I'm stubborn. Like that can work, but it's also can be frustrating. I think for readers that are just like yelling at their book and saying, just tell her, just tell her the truth. Um, so maybe that's what's, what's mo- being moved away from mm. to an ending. That's more like external circumstances. Is he going to choose this job or is this other thing going to happen? But I, I personally love a black moment, a dark moment, a dark night of the soul or however, (laughs) which way you want to put it, like the point where you feel like, I don't know how they're getting out of this. That's what I like too. Yes. It could be they, not necessarily how am I by myself without him or her, but I like that. How are we going to, how, how are you going to solve this? Yeah. I really like that when it's kind of all the way through, but I agree. There's times when it's like, when you have no idea how they're going to get out of the situation, it's very satisfying to see them get out. But the rise of cozy in terms of there's cozy fantasy, cozy, Mm -hmm. everything is because people are also tired of the drama and they just want like, life is tough. I just want to read something where there's less drama. And if I really understand that these people are not having any problems for real. They're just like sipping tea and, and, you know, making out and having sex or whatever it might be in whatever genre it is. There's a place for that too. There's a place for yeah, everything. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, it might I not be yours. Down, Leslie. We need to find a cozy <laughs> fantasy author and I need to ask them a million questions. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the escape of the tension. And the question, that's what pulls me into the book most, but I'm not saying there's not a place for that because there's a place for all kinds of preferences there. But just for me as a reader, I want the tension. I want the twists I didn't see coming. I want the surprises. I want the moment where I'm just thinking they're really going to have to like change and put everything they have into this in order to survive it, which is why I write a lot of battles and witchy and things like that. Cause I love that as a reader, because there's something so satisfying about seeing a character that has been through hard times, have that moment where they find it within themselves, because I'm always looking for that moment inside myself. Mm -hmm. And so that ending, when I see them overcome it makes me feel hope in a way that I don't feel it any other place other than maybe video games. <laughs> That's a good point. It's like why, you know, we all come to writing for different things. We come to the books that we read for different reasons too. But as writers, I think we sort of have a theme that we're always grappling with. Do you have a sense of that? Do you know what your personal theme as an author is? You know, so much of my themes are really about that moment of, I write a lot of found family a lot of you, this is the the people that you choose and those are the people that become your family. So I write a lot of that type of community writing, um, heroine's journey type writing, but I also write a lot of that you are the chosen one, but you have a lot of obstacles in your way and you are going to have to become the person you were always meant to be in order to defeat this. And that's kind of that universal theme. And that's the way I live my life too. So it makes sense that that's what I'm always writing is how is this person going to overcome these amazing obstacles? And it always comes from somehow learning to just embrace who they truly are. That is so beautiful. It, it is a theme. We haven't talked about heart breathings and all of the other things that you do as support for writers. Um, the HB90. So if you're a writer and you need organizational planning, uh, Kanban boards, all of those things. <laughs> I mean, you're very well known in the community because you've helped a lot of people, but that is a part of like your non-authoring, but also supporting writers with lots of videos and definitely check out her Heart Breathing's YouTube channel and all of the wonderful work you're doing there because it's part of it. Like we are, as people, We're bringing all of ourselves into our work, into our art, no matter what it is, and into the things that we spend time in, whether it is artistic pursuits and teaching, helping other people, mentoring, whatever it is. So 
that is really cool. And I think it's important to incorporate your whole self, you know, and we might not do it consciously, but it's like the only thing we can do. Like this is our soul and this is coming out no matter what. So we might as well try to focus it if we can. And, uh, and yeah, just that's, that's what art is to me. I think that's really yeah. cool. When I, when I think about, and when, you know, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time said, but why, why is it that you want to be a writer? Like, I just want to understand what it is you want to accomplish through this. And I never even thought to say like money or bestseller or any of that. It was just immediately the answer was, I want to make people feel like they're a part of something greater. Like give people that hope that I belong to something, even if they're alone in their room with a book, like this is my family. I know if, if Harper can make it through it, I can make it through it. And that may sound grandiose for a book, but I think it, that is really the power of so much fiction is just, I, no matter what I'm facing in my life, I can see an example of somebody who overcame impossible odds, whether it be in whatever genre, but it's just that. And so I try to really make that the core essence of of each of my characters is how can they go into this impossible thing and overcome it? And I feel that that builds a sense in the reader themselves of like, I belong to this world because I feel what she feels. And if I can make them feel that, then they can also feel what it's like to overcome hard things. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's where the twists come in <laughs> because it's, it draw it, there's something to me and to the, the type of reader that I'm writing for, it's so much fun and so exciting to see, oh my gosh, betrayed again, or oh my gosh, she really got him. Cause some of the twists aren't just betrayals or hard things. Some of the twists are like, oh, my character knew what she was doing all, all along. Go Harper. Like, you know, that kind of thing. Some of those are surprises too of like, oh, she had this planned. And, you know, I, I think that is really fun to read. And the more those questions and that excitement builds, it builds your heart rate. It builds your emotion. It builds how invested you are in this journey. Um, and not that there's not a place for calm, peaceful books too, but for me, it's, the more twisty it is and the more exciting in that way mixed with the resonance of those emotional buttons, then the more I'm, I'm all in and I'm feeling it and I'm experiencing it and I'm seeing it so clearly in my head, like a movie that I'm there, I'm part mm -hmm. of it. And I think that the endings of chapters and scenes are a huge, huge part of that. Totally agreed. Yeah. And your, your mastery of that is clear in the work and the, the way the readers respond and the huge community of readers too. You've got a community of authors and a community of readers. So they just, it, it's just making it clear that you're very good at doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited to try out, you know, writing on Ream subscription because I think that my writing does because mm -hmm. of those cliffhangers, it lends really well to that serialized style of fiction because you've got that, oh, I'm coming back tomorrow to find out what happened, the dun, dun, dun moment. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm going to be trying that out. And I think it will, it will be a different style of writing mm -hmm. in a way, but also exactly what I've been doing all along. Right. Yeah. Just more, almost slightly more intentional. It's so interesting that you're doing it that way, because that is your superpower. My superpower is being able to write quickly, short stories with all the feels in a tight little bundle. So I am releasing like 15, 20,000 word short stories all at once on Ream exclusively. That is, that is on not Ream. a short story, Ines. That is a novel. <laughs> Novelette. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Leslie, in your view, that's short. I mean, it's short. But it's yes. short, but it's still... Short story, I would put it like 10K. No, 10K no. or less. Novella, yeah. novella 20K. You're solidly in releasing a novella every month. So I'm really <laughs> in my opinion. Novellas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's your superpower. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us. It has been so amazing. But before we go, Leslie and I, we like to talk about um, a bit of everyday magic that has happened recently in your life that you can point to and say, oh, that was just so amazing, so wonderful. Something like a kid did, something you saw on a walk, something you read about. Can you share with us any 
piece of everyday magic? I mean, you're you're my piece right oh, here. So ah. <laughs> I mean, first of all, just just being able to write with you ladies in the morning is making a huge difference for me. But I I have been over the last couple of years, as I've been really focused on the courses and supporting writers, it has been more difficult to also find the time and creative energy to put into my own writing. So my sad readers have been left on a book 11, like penultimate cliffhanger for over two years. And I have been waiting for that creative energy to finish that series out because that final book is going to take everything in my soul to make it amazing because that's the ultimate resonance. Right. But when I started making shifts for and thinking about 2024, I was like, okay, my word of the year, my phrase of the year is going to be cherry on top because I want to stop focusing on, Oh, I got to grow to stay relevant. I got to maintain momentum. I got to do all these things because that's where my mindset has been. Not, I mean, it has been on service too, but it's always this like, race to how can I keep growing? How can I keep serving? How can I keep up leveling? And I just thought, you know what, this year is going to be about gratitude. I got everything I need. I'm so grateful for it. And then it's going to be about the joy of getting back to the storytelling and to just be serving people out of pure joy and not on how many subscribers or anything else externally, that stuff will all take care of itself. As long as I'm focused on the core of the passion of what I'm doing and so I woke up first day, we were all going to write together, which is a big move for me of like, I'm not going to prioritize any other deadlines. The writing is the priority every day. And that's a shift for me over the past five years since I started Heartbreak Things. And so I said, in my morning journaling, I said, just send me a sign that this is the right path for me, that everything's going to be okay. And I'm going to be supported. I'm not going to lose my income or anything else. It's just all going to work out. And we were writing. And then as we were about to get off, Ines says, I got to go eat lunch because I, all I've been eating is cherries. <laughs> it was magic. That was it. Was, it was magic. And I'm telling you, I cried after because um, oh Ines God. holds up this cherry with the stem and everything. It's like, I don't even know that I've ever been on a call with anyone in my life who was eating <laughs> cherries on a stem, like ever. And I knew that that was a moment for me, a wink, a magic, magical moment. That's a resonant button right there. As we were about to go, that resonated in my heart because it was a sign from the universe to say the, this is who you are, is you are a storyteller. You are a supporter. You are a community builder. And as long as you focus on those things, everything is going to be okay. I don't have to focus on, it gets so easy to get focused on, oh, but I got to feed this algorithm, or I got to try this new marketing tactic. And all those things are part of the strategy. But when we turn our focus fully to that, and we begin to shift what we're putting out in the world and the energy we're putting into it, chasing those things, I think is sometimes damaging to our soul. And so for me, it's just this year's that course correction back to I just want to put my passion into the world and to be as true to myself as possible. And I'm not going to be afraid to do that anymore. So that was my magical moment. Long story, but. No, that was beautiful. Yeah, we were all amazed by that. It was just like. <laughs> I had to take a picture. I have a picture of it because it was just, it was so, it was just so meaningful. Like you can't, Yeah, you I couldn't have it. scripted that. It was just a moment that was meant to be. So. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Thank you, ladies, for being part of my magical year. <laughs> thank you for bringing your magic to us every morning. Leslie, <laughs> uh, can you can you follow that up? <laughs> That's tough. That's tough. But I did have a moment yesterday of everyday magic. I have been plotting a story that's, that I've been working on on and off for 10 years. I'm replotting it. And I have this other story that I talked about on my podcast, on My Imaginary Friends. Like, there's three things I wanted to write this year. Two of them I had been working on before for many years. The third one was a new idea and I had no nothing for it, just like basic premise. And so yesterday I was like, well, let me spend one of the sprints that we write together just brainstorming this premise. And I was brainstorming and I asked ChatGPT for some ideas and it gave me terrible ideas. <laughs> but from those terrible ideas, I was like, wait. And I got this really cool 
That's the magic of ChatGPT. Yes, the spark of inspiration for this third idea. It's still very, it's still just a seed, just a spark, but it's it's enough that I know it will grow into something amazing over time. And that that, that is exactly what I needed. I had been like, it had, this idea had been in my mind for six months, eight months, something like that, with nothing, just like words. I was like, I have no idea how to approach it. I don't know where it's going. What can I do with it? And then like, that feeling when you get it, when you're like, oh, this could be amazing once I spend the next year <laughs> figuring out what it is. <laughs> but uh, the spark is there. And that is just a great feeling as an artist when you're like, okay, I've got something I can work with now. Yeah, I love That's that. My everyday magic. Yay. Next. Well, I guess the, the most recent magic, it didn't necessarily happen to me. <laughs> um, it's snowing here in the Northeast and snow is pretty to look at, but that stuff is cold. And I don't know if I've said this before, like a million times before, but I don't like the cold. Anyway, um, my daughter is home. Uh, she's 22. She's home um, for a year off between before she goes to grad school. She loves the snow, like loves it like adores it like I don't know where she gets it from but we don't have any oh, she's, because she's 22 we don't have any sleds anymore any like fun snow things anymore and I was like you know what I um I can drive you to the um hardware store because the only place that sells sleds and we got there like like two minutes before they closed and she her face Anyway, I was like, I can't do anything for you. I can't open up the hardware store. But I, I wanted to go and get, because I was going to be snowed in, and I wanted to go and get a piece of vegan sweet potato pie. <laughs> so I drive to go get the piece of vegan sweet potato pie, and we see that there's a hardware store open. Uh -huh. And there's a there's a parking spot right in front of it, <laughs> one parking spot. And I'm like, okay, go on in. And she looks out of the, the, the mirror, and she's like holding up the sled, like, ah. So she got the magic. Is she awake and out there sledding yet in this like five feet of snow? No, <laughs> but her sled is waiting for her. So that was magic. And did you get your pie? I did. I got two two slices. Have <laughs> I'm gonna eat them later. That's the real magic, the pie. <laughs> yes. So guys, um, we wanna thank you. As we're coming to the ending of this episode about <laughs> endings, we wanna thank you so much for joining us. Please let us know what you think about this episode. You can leave a comment on YouTube with your thoughts on the episode. You can also share it with a friend who loves romance and please be sure to rate us and review us on Apple's podcast or Spotify. And you can always check out our book schedule on our website, inkandmagic.net, so that you can read along the side changeling series with us. And we will see you next time. Bye everybody. Bye.